okay. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending on your time zone. Uh, here is the Young Academy of uh, Poros Media Tea Time Talks. Um, and, and good morning to everyone. I'm Federico Lanza, and today I'm uh, the chairman of this session, the 36. So it's been more than a year that we are going on, and we are happy that you are uh, uh, keeping following you. Uh, together with me today, there is Catherine Spurin and Sarah Perez that will help me uh, through all the session. Today, um, we have uh, two different uh, talks. Uh, I will say really different, both uh, relating to Poros Media, but with a really different approach. The first one that we'll talk uh, will have a uh, mostly theoretical cap. And they will talk about uh, the simulation uh, using a statistical uh, technique. The second will be more experimental and will be introduced then later. But let's uh, then start immediately with the first speaker. The first speaker is uh, Vincenzo, Vincenzo Schimenti. Um, Vincenzo Schimenti uh, is a PhD student at LPTMS. Uh, after a bachelor's degree in uh, informatic engineer and a master's degree in physics of uh, data at the University of Padova in Italy, he did um, a thesis mm -hmm. here at LPTMS, and then he was hired as a PhD student, and he's working under the supervision of uh, Professor Alberto Rosso on um, statistical mechanics of uh, disorder elastic system, including application with earthquakes and also with uh, porous media as. Uh, uh, today he's going to talk about. So Vincenzo, you can yes, uh, switch your slides. Yeah, exactly. Okay, my background is a bit different, I guess, uh, from the one of you guys. So my cut on the topic, uh, which is basically the study of Darcy Low uh, for the stress fluid in a particular geometry, which is the bed lattice. Uh, we'll talk about that uh, briefly. It's a bit more from the point of view of statistical mechanics. Okay. Uh, I, I'm not a big expert in fluids. I know the basic stuff, uh, you know, like a master level or a bachelor level, but I will try to, let's say, be as thorough as possible, okay, to make uh, everyone included in the topic. So uh, this is a joint work actually uh, with Federico here uh, and then uh, some collaborators, uh, our supervisor in France and this supervisor in, uh, in Trondheim, uh, plus some people um, which are um, uh, expert in statistical mechanics uh, like Silvio Franz. Okay, so uh, let's start from the Darcy law. Okay, the Darcy law was formulated in 1856 uh, by Darcy in France uh, in the Ville of Dijon. When they good, uh, they have a good most master actually. So you should try it. And uh, basically, it relates uh, the the, um, the flow uh, of a fluid uh, in a in a let's say in a tube. Okay, of length L. Uh, with some radius r, as you can see here, uh, with a given viscosity and at a given pressure, okay? Uh, there is a, an important parameter, which is the medium permeability, which basically is a, at, at this level is just a proportionality factor and includes uh, all the properties of, uh, of the material uh, inside the, the tube, okay? Because again, we are not talking about uh, the free flow, but we are talking about the flow inside the um, porous media. Uh, the derivation of the Darcy law, it's kind of, it's an argument mostly than an analytical one, because basically uh, Darcy started from the Poiseuille law, which actually relates the, fl the flow with the, the, the fourth power of the, of the radius of our tube, and imagined that in a, in a generic uh, porous media setting, okay, your, your, um, your tube has a radius r, okay, and it's made of tiny, um, smaller tubes where the, the flow can go through, uh, the, the, the fluid can go through, of rad radius RC. And there is a some density of these, uh, of these mi microchannels, which is indicated here by NC. And overall, 
uh, one can relate the permeability of the material with this, uh, let's say, density constant. Uh, and that's why basically you're left uh, with the, the power R squared uh, in the dependence of the full radius. There are different ways uh, to see this, uh, this, um, this, uh, this equation, okay, this, uh, this constitutive equation. Uh, this is the one that I chose uh, for the purpose of uh, uh, the next part of the talk. But this is true for Newtonian fluids, no? So what happens when there is a stress fluid, a heel stress fluid, for example? Uh, okay, in general, uh, the Boiseau law changes in the setting. Uh, we again consider um, a channel, okay, with length L, and we put a pressure P at the extrema. And when the, the fluid is Newtonian, we have the, the regular um, Boiseau law. However, this, this law is changes when we introduce a yield stress fluid. And in this case, uh, we have uh, uh, two different regimes. Uh, one where your pressure basically is not big enough uh, to make uh, the, the fluid flow, and we are in a solid regime, so there is no flux. Uh, when we reach a minimal pressure, which is given by uh, the so-called hill stress, um, uh, the flow starts to flow basically linearly. So even though the, the linear part is simple, this law is, uh, is not an, a linear law. Okay, one can imagine different forms of this law, but in general, it's not linear. And uh, this property uh, can trigger uh, interesting, um, interesting regimes. Indeed, uh, uh, from numerical simulation, uh, we can see an extended system. So basically, we take uh, this channel and we, and we consider a, a big podius media made of a lot of these uh, small channels, we, we usually observe uh, three regimes. One regime where the flow is basically linear, depends on the pressure drop. Then there is uh, a crossover um, regime where in general the flow is a power law. And finally, we recover uh, a full Newtonian regime where, uh, where again the, the flow is linear. The difference between these three regimes is actually both the power law ER beta, which in, in this plot is approximately equal to two, and uh, in the permeability, of course. Because as small pressures, as very small number of channels are open in our system, and basically, yes, the, the flow is approximately linear, but the permeability is really small because we have one channel over the full possibility of channel in the system. In the high pressure regime, basically the, um, all the channels are open. We have the maximum permeability because the full system is, uh, is full. The fluid is flowing in every channel. And we again, again we have um, um, a linear regime. In between these two uh, extremal regimes, we have an intermediate one when the pressure is some, let's say, O1 quantity, meaning uh, it's, it's a commensurable with respect to zero. And uh, there is an intermediate number of channel opening, uh, and their number is really non-trivial. Okay, uh, in this setting where the channel can open, uh, like in a, in a, in a two-dimensional fashion, okay, uh, actually the um, this intermediate regime has fractal properties, so it's really rich, and generates uh, a flow which scales as a square of the applied pressure in this regime here. So, however, um, OK, in general, uh, to analyze these systems, we use the so-called network core model, OK? And we use a, a simplified version where uh, take a network. Basically, the network is made of channels which connect regions of your material, which is modeled as a disordered material and with a random network, let's say. Uh, and this channel connect different um, pores, which are nodes of the network, where we can actually measure the pressure. So the pressure there is well defined. And, uh, and between each uh, node, there is a channel with a well defined uh, pressure threshold, okay, which is the yield stress uh, fluid, uh, pressure threshold. Okay? And if uh, in that channel the pressure is not high enough, no flow will, be, will occur. Okay? Uh, we, in, in these approaches, uh, we just consider the possibility of having directed networks, meaning we can always identify at least uh, one, uh, one inlet where we, we, we apply the pressure and one or more outlets where we put the pressure to zero. And the fluid will always go from the inlet to the outlet, never going back. 
actually you can do the full simulation and the number of times the fluid goes back it's really negligible so it's a good approximation okay so basically uh, in the geometry we're considering today we consider a simplified geometry which is basically the, um, the first non-trivial geometry one can consider this problem on the trivial one will be just a tube okay or a collection of independent tube in that case everything can be done explicitly analytically so we skip that one and we try to analyze this problem in, uh, in the so-called um, beta lattice which is basically a binary tree in this case so you can imagine that you, you apply some pressure here and um, if the pressure is high enough, in some channel will be some flow uh, going from the inlet to one of the possible outlets. Since this is a tree, uh, the tree is characterized by the number of levels, which is basically the number of times the tree splits into. Okay, and uh, to have a flow in a channel, in every let's say small part of the single channel, the pressure must be enough to open that part of the channel. So we don't allow um partial uh, flows let's say uh the flu the flow can go from here down down and it cannot stop before going uh, to the bottom of course uh there is a nice mapping uh between uh, this problem at least uh the the first channel that opens uh, in this problem and this is called directed polymer on the beta lattice a directed polymer uh, you can imagine it's just um, it's a model of a, of a polymer okay moving in some medium in this case the medium is uh, the beta lattice and uh, every polymer has an energy associated to it and uh, we can imagine that in the beta lattice uh, with t levels there are two to the t minus one possible polymers that can uh, we can create and each energy of the polymer is just given by the sum of the ill stress thresholds along uh, that line so as i said uh, in each channel there is uh, some threshold if you sum all the threshold in a given channel you can define some kind of energy so what happens uh, sorry is that uh, at the start when you apply a zero pressure okay you will never see any flow occurring. As you start increasing the pressure, at some point, uh, your pressure will be high enough to, to reach the energy of the, um, of the channel with the minimal sum of energy uh, of, um, of thresholds, and the channel will open. We can quantify, actually, uh, the pressure that we need to, to open the channel and this given by an, an express formula, which is, uh, was derived by Derrida, a famous physicist uh, in the 90s and also nowadays. But I won't lose too much time into, into this. Basically, you can imagine that this pressure is just proportional to the depth of the tree. So if you consider a tree with T levels, it will be proportional to T. Uh, what happens? So basically, after you open the first channel that I color here in light blue, okay, uh, different channel can start to open, okay? Uh, two types of channel basically are allowed. One, which are really different from your, your first channel. And we say that this channel and the first one that we say it's the ground state channel, okay? And this is the excited channel, will have low overlap, meaning the number of uh, steps they do together is really small, okay? On the other end, uh, one can have uh, that the following cha the channel that open after the first one will have a high overlap uh, with respect to the first channel. And basically, they, they, their path coincide up to some point uh, really down along the tree uh, where they separate. What do we expect, uh, actually, uh, for the new channel to open? Intuit in, intuitively, one can say, okay, depends really on the situation. But actually, uh, we can compute uh, the pressure that we need above the first, pre the critical pressure, which is the one that opened the first channel, to open the, the following one uh, as a function of the energy of this channel, which is again the sum of the, 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 the thresholds, and the overlap of this channel with the ground state. Okay? 
with the with the base channel. If you take T to infinity, so you consider a really large system, okay, you see that this prefactor, which must be minimized in this equation, uh, expressing indeed this, this pressure, uh, will prefer channels with Q really small. Because if Q is in the order of T here, this factor has explodes and you have a really high opening pressure. Since you want to take a minimum, uh, we can discuss uh, how, how we arrive to this equation maybe later at the end of the presentation. But still, you will prefer a small overlap channel. In this language, we can say that as you start opening new channel, meaning you increase the pressure, uh, you will, will observe channels that open in this fashion here. So you first open this one, and then you start opening channels with really small overlap. So they separate immediately from the previous ones. And we, you will never basically observe uh, the second type of channels, the one that follow your previous one up to the end. Uh, OK, now is the time to show you guys the video, which kind of express uh, this property here. Uh, let me share the screen. Uh, just discovered that I can't share the screen because Chrome and the Mac are not really friends. Uh, so maybe I can send uh, this video later if you guys are interested, because like we can put it in, um, in on YouTube and we can put a, a, a link to YouTube. Uh, uh, otherwise, I have to close the, the streaming, so it's better to, to skip this. Um, so basically, uh, you can observe in this you can imagine that there is this video and the, the, the channel will start to open, and this is a true simulation, uh, from the top. And you will need to reach really high pressures to start to open channels which form at the bottom of the tree. Uh, indeed, uh, in this approximation, we can imagine that all these channels are independent. OK, I don't want to go too much into the details. And we can actually compute the, flu the flux uh, as a function of the applied pressure difference between uh, this pressure P and the starting pressure. And in this case, it's exponential, OK? Before, I told you guys that one observes in this kind of models a nonlinear flow. In that case, it was quadratic. Uh, we, can, we can take back the, the picture here. It is, I think I put it here, you see? Usually, this regime, the nonlinear regime of the flow, it's quadratic. However, our geometry, it's a mean field geometry, meaning it does not really have a spatial structure. So you kind of expect uh, these exponential behaviors. Um, from these two regimes, which is basically the exponential and the Newtonian nonlinear one, one can quantify uh, the, num the, the pressure that you need to basically reach the Newtonian regime. And uh, basically, with a simple argument, um, we show that this, this pressure crossover is proportional to the logarithm of the depth of the tree with some prefactor, which are not important. This means, physically, that when you are in a beta lattice and you want to saturate your beta lattice, meaning you want to reach a good flow, OK, you don't need to open all the possible 2 to the t um channels but you just need to go to a small pressure which is sub extensive because you have to imagine that the the system size of your of your system is just the depth of the tree so how how, how, how long this tree uh, develops but you just need to open a pressure which is logarithmic in this quantity to have uh, um, a sustained flow which is really interesting because uh, uh, actually, I mean, this is not trivial result, uh, and we did not expect this because, in general, one can think, okay, maybe there will be some quantity which is uh, yes related to the system size, but in this case, it's really similar, it's really simple, and it's actually probably um, a feature of this mean field behavior. So, one sh should see whether in a finite dimensional system uh, this also holds. Uh, I show here, for example, the permeability of the system as a function of the number of channels that we open for different system sizes, OK? And you see that uh, here the system size is really moderate because one cannot do simulation above t to the 23 because uh, the, the number of channels explode as 2 to the t. OK, so you imagine numerically how hard is that to simulate. And you see that the increase in permeability is really steep at the beginning. So you just need to open a small, indeed, sub-extensive 
number of channels to reach a sustained, a sustained permeability. Here, for example, uh, I, I show the number of channels that one needs to reach the 80% of the maximum permeability, which is the Newtonian permeability, which is in this case a, a, a around 0 0.5. And you see that this quantity here is perfectly linear with the system size. And the scaling factor is above 3t, okay, in this simulation here, which means that after you open a number of channels, which is proportional to t, or otherwise you reach a pressure which is logarithmic in t, the two are related, okay, uh, one basically saturates the system. And it's really, I mean, it means that this geometry is quite efficient in, in propagating the flow. Uh, so, okay, the conclusion for our work is that uh, basically we gave an explicit solution for the problem and we tried to quantify where the Newtonian behavior was reached. Um, as perspectives, well, uh, to do this work, we had to develop uh, really strong theoretical uh, techniques, uh, which maybe you don't know, you, you're not interested in because uh, they are in domain of statistical physics and disorder systems. But one interesting uh, take home message is that in this kind of problems, uh, considering uh, channels uh, uh, which basically avoid themselves, uh, okay, where the overlap between the two are really separated, uh, can be a, a key quantity, no? To, to characterize basically the flow uh, in the systems because this is exact in this, uh, let's say, mean field, let's say, geometry. But this was not investigated uh, in depth in the case of, uh, for example, a two-dimensional system, uh, which is the one that I uh, showed you guys before. Uh, for example, here, this one, okay? For example, in this system, uh, uh, people studied the Norin regime. Uh, they tried to extract uh, some scaling behavior of the flow with respect to the pressure, but it was not understood uh, why uh, one gets uh, this power two here, this Norin regime. Um, and actually, considering uh, channels which were really separated, in our opinion, can be a key quantity. So I think that's all. Uh, and I'm sorry if I've been a bit fast, uh, but. Um, I'm open to questions. Um, yeah, great. So thank you for your talk, Vincenzo. Very interesting. Um, to our audience, if you have any questions, just type them in the comments and I'll be able to read them out. So I will start with the first one from uh, Marcel. He says, uh, very nice presentation. Does the exponent beta of the nonlinear Darcy range depend on the distribution of yield stress thresholds? Absolutely not. Basically, this is true either in the case of two-dimensional system, uh, if I can give you guys some references uh, about this, if you want. Uh, so basically in this case, uh, where you have a beta two, it was tested against Gaussian exponential and uniform uh, thresholds, okay? Which basically saturate in some sense uh, the, the type of disorder you need to, to use, okay? And they, they observed the same exact uh, um, scaling, okay? If you start to use, uh, for example, uh, thresholds, uh, which are power law distributed with fat tails, then maybe this is wrong, okay? But usually one has to avoid this kind of threshold be be because in itself, uh, they are uh, leading to some kind of critical behavior, okay? Because they are anomalous. So one has to stick to simple disorder like exponential Gaussian tails and uniform. And in this case, was completely independent of that. And this is true both in the two-dimensional case and in my problem, where I considered, uh, again, the beta lattice. In my case, I tested Gaussian and uniform disorder. Uh, I fixed the variance to be the same, to, to have like uh, comparable results, and they were com perfectly equivalent. So I kind of I kinda say, no, it does not depend on disorder, which is nice. I mean, it's a good fig fingerprint. Uh, of a critical, uh, let's say, behavior. Okay, great. Um, I'll read out the second question from Marcel as well. Uh, is there experimental evidence for the nonlinear regime too? Okay. Uh, again, I'm not the expert on the fluids. I can say to you, yes. Uh, I, I had some. I read some articles uh, about some people in our lab uh, here in Paris. Uh, uh, that uh, basically we're tackling this kind of problem. Uh, I have to check the references. Uh, we are still writing the article, and actually, when we finish to, to the preprint, uh, we will have some uh, some experimental, uh, like let's say, reference there. 
I can say to you that there are. Uh, I'm quite sure about that. Maybe Federico can can say more about this. Uh, but yeah, absolutely. I mean, still now we don't know if our geometry, which is again this tree, okay, can be applied to like experimental systems. But it's a good approximation if one considers. Uh, uh, geometries uh, where there is some kind of net network structure, okay? One can see actually in statistical mechanics uh, that the, the results for beta lattice, which is this regular tree, and random networks, uh, which are a bit sparse, uh, okay? They are not too different, okay? You don't expect uh, too much different behaviors. So the analysis we, we perform uh, should be one-to-one -one applicable to more realistic networks, okay? Not to the dimensional, two dimensional systems are different. 3D systems are different because the correlation are stronger and it's more really complicated. But in this kind of weird regimes, maybe yes. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, I have one further question, just yes. a quick one. Um, so how much do you think like going from 2D to 3D or say changing the geometry will have an effect on like how much overlap there is between like this first channel and the second channel that you showed yeah again uh okay uh, i have to to tell you about something which is generally true okay in this kind of systems uh okay let's consider uh, uh okay it was clear the concept of directed polymer okay so you have a geometry in general so it's a cube it's a square it's a tree okay and you consider path, directed path okay along uh, this geometry Okay. Um, in general, in thermodynamic limit, when you consider a large system, okay, basically Giorgio Parisi, Nobel, showed that almost everywhere, at least in infinite dimension, so in infinite models, you should have the, the results I told you. So zero overlap should be important. In uh, finite dimensions, okay, you have a stronger interplay between overlap and energies, okay? So you can, let's say, find all the possible overlap in your system and not only big and small, as I, as I told here, okay? Basically, in the tree, there is this extreme behavior where either you have open channels, I mean, channels that separate immediately or they just separate at the end. In finite dimension, this behavior is less strong, okay? So you see here, uh, I put a delta function here. It's telling you that you can only find uh, channels which are zero overlap or overlap one. In finite dimension, you have a, a smoother behavior, not this singular behavior. So the analogy will be less, uh, less strong. This is for sure. I can, I can put my, my, my hand into the, the fire and swear to you that, but overall, uh, uh, this result, for example, about the pressure here, which is telling you I prefer low overlap, this is true also in that case, okay? Because basically it's a consequence of Kirchhoff flow, okay? Of, um, of conservation of, uh, of the flow, okay? If you have a channel that uh, at some point splits and then recloses again, okay? The, um, basically, the permeability, the, the effective conducibility or permeability will depend on how much these two channels are separated, okay? Of course, because you're doing, let's say, a parallel of conductance in the analogy with uh, circuit, circuits, okay? So there is an interplay also there, but it's less strong, I'd say. I'm, I'm quite sure about that. Okay, great. Um, Yes, yeah, so if we don't have any more questions, I shall thank you once again, Vincenzo. It's a pleasure, guys. And I will introduce our second speaker of today. So here's Pyman. Let me just bring him to the top. Great. So our second speaker let me just... is Pyman. Um, he did his bachelor's and his master's degree in civil and environmental engineering at Sheriff University in Tehran. And he has an internship from uh, Strasbourg in France. He is currently a PhD student at the University of Oslo, interested in the study of the flow and transport in fractured porous media, with the focus on mixing behavior at evolving microstructure. So, Paima, let me just share your uh, slides, yeah. and then the floor is yours. Uh, do you see my slides? Um, there we go. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Hello everyone, uh, thank you for the introduction and uh, I'm happy that uh, 
I'm sharing my work in this webinar. So uh, what I'm presenting uh, is the experimental part of my PhD. Uh, we are doing these experiments at PSI, Paul Scherrier Institute in Switzerland. Uh, PSI is a neutron facility that uh, provides neutron for scientific works. And uh, so in this image, what you're seeing, uh, we have a sandstone rock here in a core holder. And uh, we are injecting some fluids and with neutron, uh, we can see the flow inside. Yeah, just uh, one thing about, uh, one thing that I should mention about the title, uh, it's Neutron and X-ray Imaging. Uh, so I'm not presenting the X-ray data because uh, uh, we had an experiment two weeks ago uh, with the high resolution X-ray and uh, uh, we are still in the middle of the processing. Uh, what I'm presenting is the Neutron data uh, that we did uh, last year on November. Okay, so what is our motivation? Uh, we know that reactive mixing can change the porosity uh, in two ways, either due to the solution. For example, if we inject an acidic fluid into a porous rock, uh, this acidic fluid can mix with the solid phase and during the solution, the porosity increases. Uh, the other way is precipitation. Uh, for example, in our case, when we inject calcium chloride and sodium carbonate, uh, these two can react with each other and they produce calcite, calcium carbonate, and during this mixture, uh, the porosity decreases. So what we are interested in is that uh, how does this uh, porosity evolution uh, impact on the mixing? Okay, but how to see the flow inside the rock? Rock is not transparent, so the answer is neutron imaging. Uh, just to understand the difference between neutron and X-ray, uh, neutron is sensitive to light material. For example, this image, uh, the image of the camera uh, was taken with neutron and uh, you see, for example, the film inside the camera, the plastic parts. Uh, but if you want to see the metal parts, you have to use X-ray because X-ray is uh, sensitive to massive material. That's why, for example, if you have a broken hand, you see the doctor and uh, the doctor take X-ray from your hand to see the bones. Another example uh, is our experimental data. For example, we can see the flu inside, the, inside this rock with neutron, but uh, with, with X-ray, uh, we can see just the solid phase and uh, the precipitation if we have high resolution. Okay, so our experimental setup. So we have a sandstone rock uh, in a core holder like this. And uh, from top, we have some injection of fluids. And from the bottom, we have some outflows. Uh, at the top and bottom of the sandstone, we have a, a porous glass. Uh, we call it a spacer, so we use it to just uh, homogeneously, it helps us to uh, inject the flow homogeneously inside the rock. And during this, uh, during this injection, we, uh, the core holder is rotating, so we can have uh, a scanning of neutrons uh, during the mixture. The step of our experiments, first we inject heavy water. Uh, heavy water is different from normal water, it's D2O, deuterium, instead of hydrogen. We don't use normal water because the uh, neutron is very sensitive to hydrogen. So that's why we use heavy water. Uh, because if we use normal water, the, our images would be blur. Next step is uh, we inject calcium chloride and sodium carbonate. So we have precipitation based on this reaction, calcite precipitation. And then again, we inject heavy water. So our main goal is to just uh, compare this injection, the last injection and the first injection to see the difference to see the impact of precipitation. Okay, so uh, in this image, you see the room that we were doing the experiments. Uh, it's quite a busy room. So here is our core holder, uh, the sample inside, and uh, we have neutron from here and a detector here. And uh, this core holder, as I said, uh, is rotating and we have 2D images, radiographs, uh, tomographs from different angles, and uh, we can reconstruct this data to have 3D volume. As you can see here, we have uh, at the end of the experiments, we just get some bunch of uh, 2D gray scale images and uh, we have to reconstruct the data and uh, we can get these slices and uh, by combining them, we can have this 3D visualization. Okay, now our results. Uh, first, on this plot, the horizontal axis is the time so we have this, some scans. The red stars uh, represent the one complete scan. Also, we have some yellow stars, so uh, 
they were showing uh, incomplete scans. So due to some reasons, we had to just stop the camera and we had some incomplete scans. And the vertical axis is the, the average of normalized pixel value. Uh, so it's, uh, it, there, it's in the range of between zero and one. Zero means that we have like dark image and one uh, means that we have white image. Here uh, in this first uh, first GIF file, uh, you see the uh, you see the 2D images, 2D grayscale images at the, some specific angle. And uh, when we reconstruct this these data, we can have this uh, 3D volume. And at the same time, you see the velocity field that I calculated based on this uh, advective equation. So uh, this phi is velocity, c is the uh, intensity at each pixel. So uh, we can get the u, the velocity field, uh, so at each pixel. So just to summarize this, uh, the steps, first we inject heavy water uh, into, this, into unsaturated rock. And then here we are injecting calcium chloride and sodium carbonate. So in this step, uh, we have one step of precipitation here. These two react with each other. And then again, we inject heavy water and repeat the steps. Again, we, we are injecting calcium chloride and sodium carbonate. So we have a second phase of precipitation here. And the, at the end, we inject uh, heavy water. Uh, just one thing is that uh, the concentration here is uh, more than this one. So uh, this is our main part of precipitation. We have two molar injection of calcium chloride and sodium carbonate, also with a higher uh, flow rate. So uh, the precipitation in this stage uh, in this step, uh, cause like 3% of porosity change. But uh, here we have just less than 1% of porosity change. So uh, if we compare these two uh, injection, heavy water before the precipitation and after the precipitation, uh, we, can, we can reach our goal. So uh, yeah, here uh, we are comparing these uh, heavy water injections. Uh, in this plot, you see the uh, PDF of velocity, probability density function of velocity. Uh, so the red one uh, is the first injection of heavy water. Uh, it was the injection of uh, heavy water into unsaturated rock. It was a transient flow. So, uh, But what we want to compare is these two, green and blue one. The blue one is the injection before the precipitation, our main pre precipitation. And the green one is uh, the injection of heavy water after the main of precipitation. So uh, if we see, uh, we can see that uh, the green one has a wider range. For example, in some areas, we have a higher velocity after the precipitation. And in some other areas, we have the lower velocity of, uh, of, of velocity. So uh, physically, we can justify that because uh, when we have precipitation, we have some clogging in some areas in the sample. So uh, this clogging causes uh, that uh, in the area that we have clogging, uh, the velocity would be lower than the previous injection. And in the other area, because we have the same rate of the, the same flow rate, uh, in the other area, we would have higher velocity. Also, if we subtract these two curves, uh, we can have this image. So basically, in this image, uh, you can see uh, I just calculated the velocity field uh, after the precipitation minus the velocity field before the precipitation. So these colors uh, represent the uh, velocity magnitude difference. So in these blue areas that we have like positive, uh, positive uh, magnitude, it means that the velocity after precipitation is higher than the velocity before the precipitation. So it means that in this area, we shouldn't expect precipitation. But in the contrary, in the area that we have red, uh, red color, it means that the velocity after the precipitation is lower than the velocity before the precipitation. So it means that in the red area, we should expect some clogging. So what we want to do is just uh, the compare the high resolution X-ray data just to see the calcis and compare it with our velocity field to see uh, uh, we are on the right, right path. So just uh, to summarize, uh, so we use a con con contrast in neutron attenuation just to get the 3D velocity field. Uh, 
by solving the advection equation at each pixel. And uh, we saw that uh, this precipitation widens the distribution of fluid uh, velocities. And uh, so our next step is uh, analyzing the data that uh, we had the experiment two weeks ago. So we use the high resolution of X-ray and neutron at the same time. Uh, so we analyze the data just uh, to reach our goal to find the link between precipitation growth and the mixing behavior. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Simon, for this interesting talk. Uh, I would encourage people from the audience to put the question in the chat. And uh, in the meanwhile, uh, I would have a small question to stop. Um, how do you expect to relate your neutron image of the X-ray one? Can you just comment a bit further about that? Sorry, how, how can I relate what? Uh, your your X-ray images with the neutron one. And uh, the so, so yes, uh, as I said, uh, with X-ray images, uh, we can see the solid phase. We can see the precipitation. So uh, just to show you, uh, we have some this kind of precipitation, this solid phase inside this rock, inside the rock after uh, after the reaction. So uh, yeah, with neutron, with neutron, we can uh, we can see the flow inside. And uh, what we can do is that uh, with neutron, we can get the velocity field. And uh, with velocity field, uh, for example, in the areas that we have lower velocity field, uh, we can expect that in that area we have precipitation. So we want to compare it with our X-ray data to see if we really have the precipitation inside that area. Okay, great. And yeah. have you observed kind of uh, preferential precipitation on the inlet of your sample? So is the precipitation homogeneous? Uh, so it's not uh, based on our uh, based on our uh, velocity field, the difference that I showed. Uh, so. Apparently, it's not homogeneous, uh, but what we expect, uh, what we expected before the experiment is that uh, when we inject, uh, uh, when we inject at the same time calcium chloride and sodium carbonate, we should uh, have some interface of precipitation. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the experiment that I, I was showing, uh, we just have, uh, we just had one inlet. So, uh, so maybe, yes, uh, maybe uh, not homogeneous, maybe in the in the lower part, maybe we have more precipitation because uh, we are injecting from bottom and uh, they just accumulate at the at the at the bottom. Thank you. Yeah. And last question to my side, and then I will ask this to you as well. Um, have you done some numerical simulation to compare with your experiments, or are there people in your group doing things like that? Yes, uh, part of my PhD is a uh, simulation. So, uh, uh, but uh, it's a bit hard to just, uh, you know, exactly uh, have the same, have the same, like boundary, mm -hmm. set the same boundary conditions at uh, in the experiments because uh, in the experiments that uh, I was doing, uh, we don't know the confining pressure. So, uh, mm -hmm. in the experiments, we were we were seeing some fluids at the side. So it means that uh we didn't have uh, enough confining pressure so uh, uh it's not very easy just to set the exact boundary condition yeah okay. um i had a quick technical question if that's okay yeah yes um when you're doing the neutron imaging and x-ray imaging are you actually able to do both types at the same time with the same like temporal resolution or do you have to like stagger them uh, so, yes, that's a good question. If we want to do at the same time, uh, so uh, we have to like set uh, set the some uh, same specific resolution, so to have just the same temporal resolution. But uh, what we are interested in is just before and after precipitation. So, uh, what we can do, what we did in the last experiment, we just uh, had one high resolution X-ray before the precipitation and mm -hmm. one high resolution X-ray after the precipitation. Mm -hmm. So uh, in this way, we can compare uh, these two images to get the area of it casted. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any Thank more you. questions 
from the chat of the audience? I, did I go? No? Okay. I guess we are done with questions. So thank you again, Naiman, and thank you to both of our speakers. And uh, I will just uh, close uh, today's session now. So you are uh, really welcome to uh, together for the, our next Bruce Media Time Talk in two weeks. And it will be a, a French uh, Bruce Media Tea Time Talk time, because we have two speakers from uh, Toulouse, uh, Simon Kazuran and Omar Mokhtari, who will speak about uncovering the and tamam properties of Arctic lichens, moth and peat from Thomas dominated catchment and flow of polymer solutions through obstacles away. So looking forward to see you there. And uh, yes, thank you everyone for, for being here on behalf of the, our team. And if you are interested in giving a talk for our next session, please uh, feel free to contact us at uh, forestmedia.tt at gmail.com. Thank you everyone. <laughs>